Namaste yogis, my name is Serenity and welcome to your intro to yoga philosophy class. Today is the first of a series that will continue on today onward and we'll be diving into the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And in order to really understand what the Yoga Sutras are, I'd like to start with a bit of a poem and go right into the general overview of the Yoga Sutras and why they're relevant to us in our modern age. And I have some recommended books to move forward with this series. The first one I'll mention is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, a biography by David Gordon White. This is a great summary of the text itself and describes um, the history, the context, all the important facets uh, about the Pasanjali Yoga Sutras. Let's go ahead and start with a reading. And this is a poem that was written by Swami Shankarananda regarding the Yoga Sutras. To catch the mind and keep it still is no small problem for my porous will, as many times as I shut it down, unceasing thoughts on me rebound. In youth, I tried through alcohol to ease my stress and cool my gall. In later years, I turned to grass. The effects were good, but did not last. At last, with failing hopes, I turned to eastern paths, and my soul yearned to scale the mystic heights of bliss. Alas, no easy message, this. And now with age and turmoil weary, all that's left me is this query. Will heartbreak or mine implode before my vrittis do nerode? So this last section, before my vrittis do nerode, is in reference to the second line in the first chapter of the Yoga Sutras, which says, Chitta vritti nerodaha. Yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of mind. And so he's saying, what's left of me is this query. Will my heart break or mind implode before my fluctuations do cease? And that's exactly what the Patanjali Yoga Sutras are about. It's about the cessations of the fluctuations of the mind. And although many people in modern yoga may associate yoga with postures, that's actually what's considered in a yoga studies framework as hatha yoga. In Patanjali Yoga Sutras, mainly focuses on the mind, the cultivation of stillness, and finding enlightenment through a succinct and clear scientific method. And there are other traditions that like to honor the Yoga Sutras by calling in the author, Sage Patanjali, who more than 3,000 year ago, years ago wrote the Yoga Sutras. And as I mentioned before, Patanjali Yoga off provides a very scientific and practical exposition of the philosophy. There are eight limbs of yoga, which you may have heard of before, which are also referenced and mentioned in the sutras. And so now that we've read the poem, let's go ahead and listen to the invocation to the sage Patanjali. In many schools of thought, and not all of them, they actually like to call in the energy, the essence of the enlightened mind of Patanjali to purify our speech and to really dive into the purification of the mind, which is the science of yoga. So let's go ahead and listen. Yogena chittasya padena vacha malam sharirasya chavaidyakena Yopakarotam pravaram muninam Patanjalim pranjali ranatosmi Patanjalim pranjali ranatosmi Abahu purushakaram Shankha chakra sidharinam Sahasra shirasam shwetam pranamami patanjalim 
Thank you for listening. So I'll go ahead and translate this invocation to Sage Patanjali. I respectfully bow down with folded hands and offer my salutations to Sage Patanjali, the highest among the sages who has presented the remedies for removing impurities of the body through his treatise of on Ayurveda, of language through his treatise on grammar, Patanjala Mahabhasya, and the impurities of the chitta mind field through his treatise of yoga the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. I bow to Patanjali, whose upper body above the arms is of human shape, who is carrying a conch, a discus, and a sword, and has 1,000 bright heads. So as you can see, Patanjali has, is pictured in this beautiful mythical way, but Patanjali is actually considered to be a human being, a great realized teacher. But there are lots of different mythologies that talks about how he is an incarnation of the serpent Ananta, who is infinite with a thousand heads upon which Lord Vishnu rests, a divine being who came to earth to assist humanity. And the, so I would say that this is a Hindu perspective, something that kind of is referenced in the Vedas and in other ancient scriptures. But there are also scholars and schools of thought that think of Patanjali as a school or a group of people who came together for um, self-realization. And others, of course, talk about Patanjali as a singular man who uh, was very austere in his practices. Now, before we go into a little bit more about the Yoga Sutras, I'd love to kind of describe or translate the name Patanjali here. It is derived from Pat, meaning to fall, Anjali, meaning reverential hands or offering, which talks about in, in translation, someone who has, or an avatar who fell from the heaven. So why talk about the Patanjali Yoga Sutras? Yoga Sutras are a philosophical guidebook for yogic dif uh, discipline, moral conduct, meditation, and the how to attain spiritual liberation. In the Patanta Yoga Sutra, there are 196 aphorisms that are divided into four padas or chapters, each focused on a different aspect of yoga. You may have heard of the term yamas and the niyamas, which are often referenced in yoga teacher trainings throughout the world. And so this text in particular becomes a very classic reference for yogis of the modern age to really fall on for wisdom. So I mentioned that there are four padas or chapters in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. The first one is the Samhadi Pada, which describes the process and the realization of yogic concentration. Samadhi, the word itself, much like any other Sanskrit word, has many, many different definitions. So you may have heard the word samadhi before, almost used as a word um, synchronous to enlightenment. Samadhi, however, in this context, is translated as yoga concentration. The second chapter is the sadhana pada, the practice or discipline to achieve yogic goals. Sadhana in another way of looking at it, it's considered our daily practice, something we come to um, regularly to train our mind and body so that we can remember ourselves as spirit. The next chapter is called the Vibhuti Pada or the manifestation of extraordinary powers in yoga. They're also known as like the, the Siddhi Pada, Siddhi meaning yogic attainments or magic attainment. The last pada is called the Kavalya pada, the attainment of liberation and isolation. Kavalya actually translates as perfect aloneness, which is interesting, especially when we think about the word yoga. In my first lecture of the introduction to yoga philosophy, I mentioned how yoga can translate to yoke or union. In this case, this is actually making a reference to Samkhya philosophy, which I also mentioned in another class. In Samkhya, opposite to our popular understanding of yoga is to separate. What are we separating? The witnessed from the witness, our observing mind from the experiencer, and allowing this separation to be another third view to see oneself with neutrality. So moving into the history of the Yoga Sutras, 
The Yoga Sutras are believed to have been compiled around the 2nd century BCE. There are many cultural and intellectual milieu of ancient India that affected the Yoga Sutras, and if and it's important to think about the context in which the Yoga Sutras came to be. In this, con in this world where the Yoga Sutras were born, philosophies like Samkhya, Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism were very much prevalent and alive. And many scholars actually say that Patanjali was deeply influenced by Buddhism, which rejected and almost um, protested against many ideas of Hinduism. So one thing you'll see as we read through the Patanjali Yoga Sutras is that it does not necessarily claim to have a religious origin or a religious home. The Patanjali Yoga Sutras are meant to be non-sectarian, meaning people of all religious backgrounds can come to the text to understand their mind and allow it to be a spiritual practice that is added to their personal ethos and their personal understandings of our world. So again, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras is an evolution of yogic practices and philosophies over time, meaning that the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, although it, it is believed to be compiled in the second century BCE, was actually an oral tradition, meaning that there are many, many years, decades, centuries, for all we know, of the Yoga Sutras that were passed down through oral transmission that we do not have any physical evidence for. So this is why it's actually really important to have commentaries in with the sutras themselves. If you see the sutras, you'll actually find them to be quite simple. For example, the very first line, for example, the very first line, right, talks about how yoga is, um, actually, let's just reframe. The very first line says, Atta yoga nushasanam, very simple. In one way to translate it, it means attend to these teachings on yoga. And then it keeps going into to these shorter aphorisms. The reason why commentaries are important is because these aphorisms are meant to, um, some scholars speculate, to actually cause a little bit of confusion. They're not meant to be read on their own. In fact, they're meant to be read or learned through the understanding and the wisdom of the teacher or the guru, as I mentioned in other uh other classes to actually give the holistic full understanding of the yoga sutras themselves that being said for this class i recommend that you pick up a variety of commentaries there are many different ones out there one that i will be referencing and using throughout this class is the yoga sutras of patanjali the yoga sutras of patanjali by Edwin Bryant. You'll find that there are many different commentaries that are compiled into one book. So you can actually cross compare and see how uh, the different translations and commentaries differ from one another. This is actually really important to note. That is a benefit of the yoga traditions. We all know that the Bible exists. Right? Many people will actually look at the Bible and take it word for word and believe it to be fact. But when we really dive into the historical context and the research of the Bible, you'll see that the current Bible that we read, like the King James Version and the many varieties that are out there, are translations of an original language that is not accessible for us to use which means that many of the uh, Bible translations may or may not be in alignment with the original meaning of the text. The beautiful thing about the Yoga Sutras is that we have access to the original language, Sanskrit. And we also have access to its dictionaries and the study of the language, which means that when we look at the Yoga Sutras, we can actually understand that there are many different varieties of translations, one, and then two, the various commentaries that actually provide many different types of insights into the text itself. I'd like to show you a example of what this means. Now, we use the very first line of the first pada to show kind of the possibilities or the, the uh, concise nature of each line. Now let's go ahead and look at that. English translations of Yoga Nirota Vritti Chitta, right? We're looking here in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras book and you'll see just how many different 
possibilities there are. And it goes even on to the next page. Let's go ahead and look at some of them. Concentration is hindering of the modifications of the thinking principle. That's one possibility. Yoga is the suppression of the function of the thinking principle. That's another. Yoga is the restriction of the fluctuations of the mind stuff. Yoga is the shutdown of the processes of the mental capacity. Yoga is the cessation of the turnings of thought. Yoga is the stilling of the modifications of the mind. Disciplined meditation involves the cessation of the functioning of ordinary awareness. We become whole by stopping turns out the mind in the consciousness. Yoga is the ability to direct towards an object and sustain that direction without any distraction. Yoga is the cessation of the misidentification with the modifications of the mind. As you can see here, the many different translations are, are close in nature, but offer different meanings to the very important teachings in each line. I know I just dove really deep in, into the topic of the yoga sutras right away but i'd like to pause and ask some questions to you guys what does yoga mean to you personally what is your current understanding of the yoga sutras and what motivated you to join this lecture series on the yoga sutras of patanjali next what surprises you about the structure or the content of the yoga sutras how do the themes of the four padas resonate with their current yoga practice. How do you think studying the yoga sutras might influence your yoga practice? And how have the different uh, commentaries enriched your understanding of a specific sutra or the yoga sutras as a whole? Now that is for more advanced or um, previously read yogis of the yoga sutra. And that's a little bit of the background. Let's get right into looking at the text itself. Samadhi Pada. Let's hear the correct pronunciation here. Atha Yoga Anushasanam. Atha Yoga Anushasanam. Atha means now. Yoga, which can mean union, connection, joining from the root yuj. And Anushasana, which means instruction, direction, teaching. So there are a few variations of this translation, which I already went over, but let's go for a uh, specific commentaries. So Dr. Chris Chapel offers this one, attend to the teachings of yoga. And then we have Hari Hari Nanda Aranya, who says now then the yoga is being explained. Barbara Miller, who's one of the only women who have translated and provided commentaries on the sutras, says this is the teaching of yoga. Now this first one is really simple. And I've already talked about it a, a lot. So let's go ahead and move to the second one. This is probably the most famous line from Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which is something that I already mentioned. Now let's hear the correct pronunciation. Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodhaha. Yoga Chitri Vritti Nirodhaha. That's my best attempt. Now, why is it important to understand and listen to the correct pronunciation? The Sanskrit itself is a holy vibrational language. When we make the pronunciations correctly, we're actually healing our body and healing our minds and the world around us simply through its recitation. So, Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha. Dr. Chapel uh, translates it as, Yoga is the restraint of the fluctuations of the mind. I'll offer a few different variations. Yoga is the suppression suppression of the modifications of the mind. Yoga is an inhibition of the modifications of the mind. Yoga is the nirodha, process of ending of the vritti, definitions of chitta, the field of consciousness. Yoga is the cessation of the turnings of thought. The restraint of the modifications of the mind stuff is yoga. Yoga is the control of thought waves in the mind. And yoga is restraining the mind stuff, chitta, from taking various forms, vritti. Now, what does that mean? In our normal waking life, when we sit in meditation, how many thoughts continue to come and go? Even when we're not sitting in meditation, from the moment we open our eyes, we think of all of our to-do lists. Our emotional states go all over the place. In a single day, we can both be happy, sad self-conscious, confident, 
um, greedy, we can have all these different emotions and feelings come through as if we have no control. What this line, this very famous line suggests is that all the fluctuations of the mind, the way it dances, the way it moves into all these different expressions is actually able to be controlled and that our mind state or our fluctuations of mind is not actually who we are, which comes from a very Sabnika philosophy perspective. So now let's go ahead and read some additional commentary that it's offered uh, by Edwin F. Bryant, which is the main text that we'll be using throughout this class. So let's go ahead and read it together. It is common for authors of philosophical works to commence their treatises by announcing the specific nature of the subject matter. So that's referring to the very first line. Now going to the second, there are various definitions of yoga expressed in different traditions, which while all overlapping, reflect the fact that yoga referred to as a cluster of practices featuring various forms of discipline and mind control are differing uh, depending on the aesthetics and the communities on the landscape of ancient India with a view to liberation from the sufferings of embodied life. It was not associated with a distinct school until well into the common era, as I mentioned. In the Katha Upanishad, for example, yoga is believed to be when the senses are firmly under control, while in the Karma Yoga, the path of action section in the Bhagavad Gita, yoga is defined as samatham, evenness of mind, and as karmasu kusalam, skill in action. Elsewhere, the text defines yoga as dukkha samyoga vigyogam, separation from union with pain, which is essentially the uh, definition given in the Vaishika Sutras, dukkha bhava, the, abs the absence of pain, a definition that finds its roots in the Katha Upanishad. The Nyaya Sutras associate the practice of yoga with the attainment of liberation, while his teachings will incorporate the above definitions, Patanjali here gives a formal definition of yoga from the classical school of yoga itself. Yoga is the stilling of all thought. I'll pause there because Edwin Bryant actually gets very, very scholarly in his um, commentaries. So let's actually skip right ahead into Barbara Miller's commentary. She is one of the only women who have translated the Yoga Sutras and provides additional insight. And this is what she has to say. The meaning of this crucial section has been controversial since ancient times. Most commentators say that these aphorisms refer to the levels of contemplative calm or samadhi. Others, however, argue that they refer to the cessation of thought Naroda. And this interpretation I develop here. All of part one of the Yoga Sutra seem to explore the meaning and means of bringing thoughts to rest. A contemplative calm is given just as one of the th states that can lead to the cessation of thought. According to Patanjali, the cessation of the turnings of thoughts comes about in various ways. On the first level, ordinary conscious processes are directed towards the aim of stilling thoughts activity. On subsequent levels, cessation involves hyperconscious processes in which every mod modification of thought is eliminated and only subliminal impressions of past experience remain. The conscious restraint of thought is related to seated contemplation of chapters 1, line 46. And as we keep going, we'll understand a little bit more depth about what it says. So you'll see that the Yoga, Patanjali Yoga Sutras kind of goes from basic introduction statement, thesis statement, and then goes deeper and deeper into its meanings. So let's go into that very next line. Sutra 1.3. Tada drashtuhu svarupe vasthanam. Tada drashtu vasrupe vasthanam. What does this mean? Well, according to Chapel, he says, then the seer abides in its own form. Now let's go ahead and read the first two to understand it a little better. Attend to these teachings of yoga. Yoga is the restraint of the fluctuations of mind. And then he says, then the seer abides in its own form. 
Let's see some other translations. Then the seer is established in his own essential nature, right? This translation gives us a little more. This is by um, Tile Mini. Here's another one. Then the abdience of the seer gesture in my own nature, Sharupa, a little bit more complicated, highlighting some more Sanskrit terms. And then Barbara Miller offers this. When thought ceases, the spirit stands in its true identity as observer to the world. Another, then the seer self abides in his own nature. The man abides in his real nature. At the time, at the time of concentration, the seer Purusha rests in his own unmodified state. Now, this is referencing Samkhya philosophy once again. And as a reminder, I would love to just bring up Purusha and Prakriti. Now, when I mentioned that yoga is not necessarily union, but rather a separation, this is what it's talking about. The witness from the experiencer. Purusha, which is that ever observant, neutral permanence, and Prakriti being the impermanent physical matter that is constantly changing. So what this is talking about is what I mentioned also in the very first class. Yoga and yoga and yoga suffering arises from the misidentification of the self. This line is actually referencing that exact point. When we identify ourselves with the fluctuations of our mind that are impermanent and ever changing, then we are actually causing ourselves suffering. Like for example, if I identify myself as anger, or if I identify myself as grief, then I experience the, those two things. However, if I identify myself as the observer of grief, the observer of joy, the observer of anger, then these emotions and feelings come through me rather than becoming me and causing even more suffering. So that is what this is talking about. I think Barbara Miller's translation is the most clear for Western minds to understand. Let me say it again. When thought ceases, the spirit stands in its true identity as observer to the world. Let's go right into the next line. We'll go up to we'll go up to the five lines in the first chapter. Vritti sarupya metaratra. Vritti sarupyam itaratra. At other times, the seer appears to assume the form of the modifications of mind, something that I mentioned just now. Another translation says, in other states, there is assimilation of the seer with the modifications of the mind. Now, another translation uh, by Vyasa says, otherwise, there's conformity to the vritti definitions. Otherwise, the observer identifies with the turnings of thought says Barbara Miller. At other times, the self appears to assume the forms of mental modification. At other times, when he is not in the state of yoga, man remains identified with the thought waves of the mind. At other times, other than that of concentration, the seer is identified with the modification, something that I actually just spoke about. And this actually becomes really um, relevant and apparent in our meditations when we actually get to witness the fluctuations without that identification. So going into that last line we'll cover for today. Now I don't know if I can do that one justice, so I'm going to play it one more time. Okay, now what does this mean? They fall into the five varieties which are, which are klishta, and the rest are a klisha. What does that mean? Klisha is kind of referencing to the different types of mind fluctuations that are there. So here's some other definitions. The modification of the mind are fivefold and are painful and not painful. Interesting, slightly different. Vritti definitions are fivefold. They are either klishta obstructing, causing pain, or a klishta non obstructing, not causing pain. Pain. So now these two variations give us a little bit more information. It's not that the fluctuations fall into five categories and that's it. They actually have harmful and not so painful forms. So let's see what Barbara Miller says. The turnings of thought, whether corrupted or immune from the forces of corruption, are five kinds. There are three more. There are five kinds of mental modifications which are either painful or painless. 
There are five kinds of thought weights, some painful, others not painful. There are five classes of modifications, some painful and others not painful. And I think we can all understand that. You know, fluctuations of mind aren't necessarily just in reference to the negative emotions. When we experience joy, when we experience love, when we experience devotion, all those things are impermanent states and therefore classified into fluctuations. So actually yoga talks about often how we want to be in a place of neutrality, one that is not lost in the highs of life or stuck in the lows, one that is able to just simply witness the entire spectrum of the human experience. And so this concludes the first class in the lecture series regarding Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Now, if I had a room full of students, I would allow for more questions and discussions regarding all the five lines that we covered today. But since I am here, Kind of recording this lecture, I will leave you all with this. What types of fluctuations of mind do you encounter most often? What are some ways that you have been able to find peace from those fluctuations? And three, if you've had a yoga practice before, have how have you experienced the fluctuations of your mind in your practice? And how have you found your center once again? Everybody, thank you so much for coming to this class. My name is, again, Serenity. I'm really passionate about this topic, especially as a yoga studies scholar from Loyola Marymount University. And I'm excited to be on this journey with you. I know we will learn a lot together.